Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Martine Severin. I'm a photographer based in Chicago, and welcome to APA Biz Talk. I'm so excited for today's discussion um, because we have a stellar group of panelists who have joined us. Um, and we're going to get right into it. But in the meantime, I'd love to pass the mic, so to speak, over to Julia. <laughs> um, hi, so I just want to remind everybody, APA is American Photographic Artists. We are a not-for-profit trade organization for professional photographers. Our sole mission is to try to help photographers succeed in business. So this part of that is these kind of conversations. I really appreciate the panelists who agreed to come onto our show and share their experiences. Um, Martine for, for, co, uh, for moderating this week, for um, Natter, Corey, who usually has been doing the biz talks for bringing together this group of panel. Um, the, he's really passionate and cares so much and really was thoughtful in how he, you know, who, who he's bringing together for that. And I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody who volunteers their time, all the photographers who volunteer and the people who volunteer to judge our contests or moderate or whatever, however they participate with APA. And just a reminder, if you're listening to this and you want to participate, the direction of APA is based on who's participating and the direction they decide they want to take APA. And so you can help, you can help create where APA goes by participating. So think about that. You have power. Thank you, and thank you to everybody. And I'm gonna be in the background. We're gonna be moderating questions. Uh, we're gonna be looking at them, and we may or may not be able to get to them. That's gonna be a, a free flow conversation. So I will hand it back over and jump on at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. All right, we're ready to get started. Um, so today our conversation is mainly going to be um, chatting with um, our esteemed panelists, I'm going to introduce them in just a little bit, about what, um, what are their experiences um, in the photo industry and in the advertising industry. Um, and I'm so excited to hear their experiences, particularly during this time. We, the world has changed since um, March. We've gone into COVID and um, the, our eyes have been opened wider to the injustices and to systematic racism that exists in the US. It's always existed. And we're now really, um, coming to terms and are demanding change. And so I'm so excited to have Lauren Crew, who is a photographer based in LA to join us. Hi, Lauren. Sorry, they, they just started construction. So if you hear some weird noises, I can't control it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we have Chris Butler, who is a, I'm sorry, who is a global and integrated project manager at TWA Worldwide. Welcome, Chris. Um, so we have um, Oriel Davis Lyons, who is creative director at Spotify. Oriel, welcome. Hello, thank you. So we have Astrid Enduha. So I tried to do the Spanish accent, <laughs> Astrid. It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> Who's um, an art director at Droga5. So welcome. Thanks for having me. And last but not least, we have Jagisha Bumaran, who is um, an artist rep at Bura Collective. I'm pronouncing your name the French way. That's probably not <laughs> the way to do it. Um, and so we... and. Again, my name is Martine Severin, I'm a commercial and lifestyle photographer based in Chicago, Illinois. And so for our discussion, I would love to start out by asking our panelists about their experience in the photo industry, in the advertising industry, from when they started. And what was that like? What was the world like when you first started? Anyone? <laughs> I'm probably the oldest one here, so I'll go first. <laughs> um, I started over 25 years ago at Shiat Day when it was like 100 people. Um, and uh, one of the things I noticed right away was 
there were really no people of color in the entire company, pretty much. You know, there were a few, um, and in it was like skewed towards certain departments more so, you know? Um, so that was something I noticed right away. Um, but, you know, I was lucky enough to start with a really progress, progressive company that had um, some incredible leadership. So I got the opportunity to um, try different departments. I did new business development and had an incredible mentor with Lori Coots, who really taught me so much in this business. And, um, and then I went into art production. I took over the art production department and ran that for about 20 years. Um, and when I was there, just speaking to what's relevant about this discussion is, uh, it was just shocking um, how dominated the photography, you know, commercial artist industry was by white males, you know. Um, so, and even in just management, in you know, everywhere. But over the course of the 25 years, um, you know, I did see a lot of efforts being made um, at Shy. We started the Minority Advertising Training Program. Um, you know, of course, in my department, I always made an effort to have diversity and try to find, you know, to make sure that our, our um, lists were diverse with men, women, um, you know, different ethnicities. But what was so difficult was that in the commercial world, it was hard to pull or find the diversity. And I think that was one of the bigger issues I saw is that, that just people of color didn't have the knowledge or the understanding or the pathway to find how to be seen in the commercial world. You know, they didn't know that, oh, I could call and sh send in a book or I could advertise in at the time, you know, some of the com communication arts or, um, you know, workbook or adage or, you know, any of these at the time that were relevant, they just didn't, it just seemed like you didn't, they weren't able to surface, you know, they were, there were amazing artists there and they just weren't able to surface. Um, so, you know, a lot of times going to some of this, the younger, some of the more smaller organizations, we were able to find artists. Um, we just made it an effort, but it was still really hard. Um, so when then I left, you know, and I started Bouvera Collective, my goal really was to have a real diverse roster um, and to really, you know, I think there's two types. There's, you know, just going to be honest, I think there's two types of agents and hopefully this is changing, but there are agents and I think you have to be a little bit of both, but there are agents who look at the artist as a commodity and this is a business. And so you want to bring in the artists that make the most money. And that is at the time, you know, was majority white male. And then, you know, there are agents who are really looking to kind of be part of the culture and the influence and make great work and be you know, part of that artist's journey and passion. Those, that's where I see, you know, there's more diversity, there's more outreach, there's more looking to bring in that, you know, be more inclusive of different types of artists. So that was, that was my mission as Boobra Collective. Um, and I'm very proud to say I represent Lauren Crew. Uh, and that's what I'm doing right now, representing a diverse group of artists. Well, I think that's an excellent segue <laughs> for us to talk to you, Lauren. I unmuted. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things that I think Jagisha just said that really stood out is that concept of that we couldn't surface, right? Like, um, I can count on one hand and on two fingers uh, how many white women, like, let me in, right? Um, other than that, as Jagisha said, it was white male. And, uh, you know, I naively just was always, like anytime I felt any sort of rejection, I always kind of was like, oh, oh, they have no fucking clue like what I'm about to do. Do you know what I mean? Like I took it personally and I applied that towards how I was gonna move forward by myself. Um, and one of the things that I realized is that assisting for years, um, people weren't trying to surface us. 
it was just, you were an assistant. There was never that person. Like I said, I can count on one hand on two fingers, the people who were like, Hey, do you want to learn more? Do you want to, you know, like, um, and that thankfully is changing. <laughs> um, I feel like I was able to surface by collectives like women photograph the second night that they came to my life shit changed <laughs> you know people started to see me like editors were coming from out of nowhere like hey we really like your work we didn't know you existed um and at the time that was met with eager enthusiasm enthusiasm to like finally be seen and and now <laughs> it just feels so tired. It's just like these waves of inclusivity and, oh, we saw you on a list. And, and so I'm older now, so I don't internalize it as personally, but it is just sort of like, admittedly, you can't help but roll your eyes at this because it's just like <sighs> the effort it takes. And again, I don't want to diminish where we're going, like, <laughs> but, um, but the effort that it takes to, or I'm sorry, the amount that we've had to tolerate and get beat up along the way, like it just doesn't have to be that way. We could have so many more empowered artists who, who show up tall, right? Rather than like build small. So I, I'm super charged about a lot of this. So I'm gonna pass the mic. <laughs> Well, I'll pass the mic over to Oriel because you recently wrote um, an article in Adweek, right? That talks about the same thing of that there's so much BS <laughs> that we have to put up with. Can you chat a little bit about your experiences? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the article was really um, me kind of unburdening myself a little bit um, after a decade, you know, in the industry and, and kind of having dealt with a lot of that stuff, um, you know, on a pretty regular basis, you know, and those are just some of the examples that you kind of experience. Um, you know, I think for me, uh, like others have said, it's you, you are usually the only person of color, the only black person in the room. I think that becomes, that's kind of the norm. Um, you, you come to expect it. And I've, you know, I've been fortunate to work at some pretty progressive, um, places you know um but um, you know that is the standard really you, you just come to kind of expect to be the only person of color um and i think you know i it, what that means is that you you don't feel like you have uh, a team with you you know when you experience this stuff um when when those comments come in and you know that it's wrong and you kind of you're looking around and you're like, did anyone else register this? You know, is it just me? And you kind of look around and everyone's just like carrying on with the meeting or whatever you're doing. Um, I think that's the thing that we take on as people of color, as black people, you know, is these um, not having someone, not having someone else to kind of say, yeah, I saw that and it was wrong and let's call it out here and now, you know? So you kind of, your career is really, um, dependent on how well you can take on that discomfort, how many of those things can you take on and kind of keep navigating, keep climbing the ladder, um, you know, until at some point you either it's too much, you know, and you burn out um, or you speak out and you maybe you face the consequences. And I hope that now I think this, the change I'm seeing now is, is just that, people are telling these stories. People are like, hey, look, this is what it's been like for me for the last 10 years. And you might have thought, you, you wouldn't have seen it because I come, I come to work every day and you know I do my best. But this is what it's been like to kind of, and this is the, the toll it's taken and the cost of, um, of getting to this point in, in our careers. So I think for me, the, you know, the article was just a way to start that process of like, getting some of that off my chest and then you see the response from people and, and everyone's like, I have a hundred of these stories. Um, you know, and, and something I, I said in the article is that, you know, we've taken on this discomfort um, so that other people, the people around us don't have to, you know, we don't pass it on to our coworkers, you know, we don't pass it on to our clients. 
we kind of internalize it, we take it on, we take it home with us to allow the, um, the company to kind of keep going and um, keep projecting, you know, essentially a, a, an image of success. And I think that is something I really want to see change is that, you know, we now, you know, not only feel like we can tell the stories, but we feel like actually, you know, we have responsibility to tell them because the success of these places that we're, we're all kind of a part of is really, you know, in large part built on the silence of people who kind of experience that um, every day. And I read in your bio that you came into the industry um, from having been a chef. Um, so going back to the original question as to um, how, what the industry was like when you, when you first um, came into it, can you chat with us about that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's about, about 10 years ago now, um, you know, so, and I didn't start my career here in, the US, I started in New Zealand, um, which in a lot of ways is, is you know, far ahead of uh, a lot of places in the world on some things, but also, you know, it has its own issues as well with representation there. Um, so even, even there, I, I was still the only, you know, one of maybe few people of color in my agency. Um, and I think maybe that the, at that time, it was less top of mind for me. You know, it wasn't that I wasn't experiencing the same things. It was just, I was at a stage in my career, I was at the beginning of my career where, you know, I didn't feel like I had any power to change it. I was like, this is, this is the industry I've chosen and I'm lucky to be in it. And that's kind of, the industry makes you think that. That's a, a kind of a default approach for a lot of, um, you know, agencies is that there is a, there's a queue outside the door, you know, you're lucky to be here. Um, so you go in with this mindset that I don't want to mess this up. So I'm not going to stop, you know, calling out this stuff, you know, if I can just deal with it personally. Um, so I think for the, the early part of my career, it was like, it, that was the kind of, it felt like the deal that I made was like, uh, okay, I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to do the work that I'm given and, you know, essentially, reap the rewards in terms of the opportunities it did give me and my family, you know, to come here to the States, for example. Um, but yeah, the, the, the other side of that deal is that you kind of don't say anything when those incidents happen, when those, those things keep coming. So I think that was where I was, you know, when I think about the start of my career and now I think, you know, 10 years later, um, you know, I've been very fortunate by, that I'm in a position now where I can speak out and I'm also in a moment where I think, you know, we are seeing like strength in numbers in that we, if we all speak out, if we all kind of start to tell these stories, you know, things are fundamentally going to change. Um, so I think that's been the biggest change I think I've seen in, in 10 years is, and especially coming to the States is that, you know, I think people are much more aware of the the problems um, and are kind of, there, there are people actively working, you know, to, to, you know, to fix them, I guess. Um, when I started, I didn't work at an agency with uh, any kind of diversity team or chief diversity officer that just, that didn't exist, you know, for me for the first few years of my career. Um, so that feels, at least that feels like progress, you know. Chris, did you want to weigh in and share with us? Sure. You know, I'm listening earlier to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, maybe I may, sp I may pronounce your name wrong, uh, Jagisha. And like, you know, 20, 30 years later, being that shy at now, and, um, you know, the, the problem still remains the same. We're so underrepresented. We're so undermined, um, you know. You know, like, you know, I get I, like, you know, and it's the minor things that, you know, hit you, but you re, you realize the difference between how you're treated and how someone not of color is treated. Like, and it could be something as simple as like keeping you off a meeting invite, not CCing you on something, asking everybody's opinion, but yours. So, um, you know, and, and that's something that Lauren Crew brought up was like, you know, you have to like really advocate for yourself. You know, you have to like 
you know, almost force fit yourself in a situation and like show that I'm here. I'm intelligent. I know the work. You assume everybody else knows the work. You assume everybody else knows what they're doing. Why don't you make that same assumption for me? And um, I think that is, that's been the biggest part of my career and the biggest part of my experiences is like, you know, just literally like forcing myself, you know, coming and showing up. And a lot of times I don't feel the pressure to show up. And I think a lot of that is because, you know, that, that isn't a good thing. Some people look at that as a good thing. as like a free ride, you know, sit back and it's like, no, um, you know, if you don't give me the pressure to show up, you're not pressuring me to grow. So that goes both ways. And I feel like that is just the struggle that I'm always facing. And, you know, and it's like, I talk to my managers and, you know, you get, you, you know, as much, as much as you prove yourself, it just seems like the stigma in their head is never reversed, you know, until they absolutely need you to come up with the answer. And then now they're speaking to you like, no, don't ask my opinion only when it refers to diversity. Like, no, I, I, I have, I have, you know, questions. I have solutions on the strategic brief that's going out that has nothing to do with diversity. I have questions on our testing tactics and, and how we're going to re how we're going to utilize these results to, you know, get to better creative, like, you know, stop, um, only uh, including me when, when you feel um, it's, it's something that I am knowledgeable about when instead of asking me a question and, and letting me, you know, the same way you ask all your other colleagues for a question or you ask for help or you ask, you know, just to help solve a problem. Like, you know, why don't you think of me in that same vein? And um, I think that's just the reality of where we are is like, we have to continue to fight and continue to push through. And, uh, you know, earlier Oriel said that, you know, said that, you know, it gets exhausting, it gets draining. Like you carry a lot on your shoulders and you get, you know, it's a lot to digress and you got to go home you know, to your neighborhood that isn't as nice as, you know, your other white coworkers' neighborhoods or like your commute isn't as nice because, you know, you didn't have a rich parent that, you know, put you up in Manhattan or like close body office in Harlem. So it's like, um, it's like we have to work twice as hard, you know, and, and I hate say it, I hate saying that like, oh, like, cause regardless whether I was at an all black agency or an all white agency, I'm going, I'm going to work twice as hard regardless to be the best that I can be. But I, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's like you have to work twice as hard just to, just to move at pace. And that is the scary part because it's like, I'm not, it's not like I'm working twice as hard because I don't have the same amount of information as you. I'm working twice as hard to prove to you that I have that information and then show it to you, you know? And uh, it gets, it gets exhausting, you know, and um, all you can do is uh, begin to speak up. And, you know, I've been, I've, I was one of those people, I came from the entertainment industry, you know, I worked at Paradigm, you know, I've worked for the only black agent at the talent agency, a very big, you're talking about a company with over 200 agents in this one LA, a Beverly Hills office. And I worked for the only black agent there. And I, and, you know, I looked at him and I, and I looked at everything that he went through to fight. And I was like, damn, like, what the hell did I set myself up for? <laughs> but I've just kind of been pushing through. And, um, you know, every year I surprise myself and I'm, you know, I give myself a pat on the back for making it another year through. Because every year I'm like, you know, like, is, you know, is, is this, maybe I should just go do something else. Maybe this ain't for me. You know, um, I was a business owner before all of this and I, and I made good money. And I was like, did I make a mistake by, you know, going out and seeking an education and, and, and wanting to, you know, convert my, um, you know, personal own business skills to the corporate America world just to like, you know, I, I like to challenge myself. Don't ask me why a lot of my decisions are, aren't the smartest from looking from the outside in. But then it's like, this is the first time in my life where I was like, why, why, would, why is it harder to come into an office space and prove myself than it was to start a whole business? Like, why is that? Like, you know, like, you know how hard it is to start a successful business and you're coming into an established business ready to do the work and willing to do the work. And why is it harder? It, it you know, it's baffling. And then, um, you know, you just have to climb those hurdles and just keep pushing because, you know, along the way you meet so many, so much younger talent out there that is like, you know, I, you know, it's, it's bigger than me. And that's a lot of the reason why I did it for, I have younger nephews and, and whatnot. We weren't, you know, we're from the Bronx. We we're not from the best neighborhoods. Um, you know, one of my nephews is going to Morgan state this year. And um, another one is like really big in, into engineering. And like, I work on the Oculus account and, just like, you know, he built his first like um, game and PC. And that's what I do it for because those things were not on my mind when I was 16 because I didn't have exposure to those things, you know? And my goal now is to give them exposure to these things. And like my nephew's going to Morgan State and gonna study marketing and advertising. And that's the thing that keeps me pushing every year, you know, when I feel like I need to just say, fuck this and <laughs> go back and, and reopen my business because that was easier to do than to sit here and just to get, you know, a senior level job, you know? I feel like I just need to go like this. <laughs> yeah. 
feel like I, I really resonate with everything you were just saying now, Chris. Um, I, I moved to the Bronx when I was 11 from the Dominican Republic. So I went to high school in the Bronx. I went to school in the Bronx. Um, I mean, I loved it there. I had a lot of Dominican families, uh, Haitian families, African families. I, I loved the community there. Um, but something that I was never exposed to was advertising. So the second agency that I started working on, uh, I think it was, it was Great New York, um, I essentially just aggregated a handful of my colleagues. Um, so this was a mix of uh, UX uh, writers, uh, I think I had someone from a county. It's like all my work besties. And I got a group of students from the high school that I attended to in the Bronx and I brought them into the agency because this was something that I never considered. I considered this industry when I was already in college learning about journalism and writing and graphic design. Um, so to me, it was incredibly important and there's nothing more exciting. And I didn't understand my capability of reaching back Till then, when I started getting all of those emails from students that were, you know, about to graduate and didn't know what to do. And I was just sitting there like, I'm a junior. I have no idea what I'm doing either. But even to them, the fact that I, I was able to kind of bring them on and just introduce them into something new was something that was very meaningful. And I'm still part of their lives. So um, it's that exposure. And um, what is interesting to me too the the first agency that i ever worked at um the most amount of diversity there was was between myself uh there was a senior writer um and my best friend from college um and that was it that was the three of us everything else was uh um, you know white folks um so yeah so there was a a tremendous amount of silencing you felt um it very much felt like a boys, you know, uh, group uh, in that sense. Um, so when I got that job at Gray, and that was my second one, that's when I, I, I remember calling them both like, you guys have to come here. This is the most diverse I have seen in my life. This is, I see people like us here. And I, all three of us eventually ended up at Gray and we had a really good time. But it was not till then when I decided to, um, like Oriel was saying, uh, kind of rise to the moment and, and realize the strength that I had within me at that point um, of, you know, being capable of reaching back. Yeah, and I, I get a lot what you're saying about um, not being exposed to advertising. It was, I never heard of an ad agency until I was 20 years old. Too. I was in this program, you know, like I, I came from the entertainment industry, but that was because in high school I got into this program called the Ghetto Film School. And mm -hmm. their pro bono ad agency is Widen and Kennedy. So we went to Widen and Kennedy to do a master class with, with Spike, Spike Jones, and because he was like the hottest commercial director at the time. And I walked into Widen and Kennedy and I was like, this, like you guys work here, this place has a basketball court, like, you know, for me, like, you know, open. And now, and then from there on, I was like, you know, this is what I want to do. Went back to school last semester and, and you know, changed my, um, changed my uh, major to advertising and PR. I was lucky enough that they got me an uh, internship at Widen. But um, yeah, it's like, we don't, we don't have exposure to these opportunities at all. If you, you know, and it's a lot of that because a lot is, is because a lot of us, right now our first generation ad people in our family and amongst our home communities at a lot of times like you know all of our peers we're first you know i have friends i went to high school with who still really like never heard of an ad agency which is you know it's a hundred year old business you know and then at this point it's like a hundred year old secret uh, that you know is is such a such like a gatekeeper to so much of culture what we see on tv who, you know, the products that we resonate and connect ourselves to. And it's like, we like, you know, it's, it's almost like, were we being kept from this for a reason, you know, at some point, like we were the film industry at a time, you know, like we are in, you know, startup and like capitalist ventures, like at this very moment, you know, it's like, so, you know, it's, it's just about, you know, like you said, being able to reach back, you know, and that is, I think, I think that is like the thing that brings me the most joy, you know, because work has a lot of ups and downs and, the best part of my day sometimes is speaking to a young, you know, mentee and, you know, or just speaking to somebody or having that conversation to, you know, talk about my experiences and what to expect. That's where I'm like, you know, this is where this can be, you know, this, this, this should be all of our legacy, all being first generation marketing and advertising, 
you know, even photography, you know, visual arts, because they, they all coincide with one another. That's a really great um, point. And to the fact that a lot of us are first generation in this industry, how do we, um, one, create um, a pipeline so that we could get more people of color? Because that's, that's one way to change the industry, one way to change the faces um, that are in the room. Um, so how do we create a pipeline and how do we um, start taking action in order to change um, the industry from the inside? Some, something I've, I've thought a lot about, actually, because um, I didn't come in to the industry in a kind of traditional sense. You know, I joined it a bit later um, in life and I did a, a, a course, um, which was essentially two nights a week for 12 weeks, you know, um, to put a portfolio together. Um, and that's what, you know, at the end of the, the 12 weeks, I had a, a book. It wasn't very good, but it got me... Um, a placement or got me an interview, a couple of interviews. And eventually that turned into an internship, um, which was still like kind of was barely paid, but you know, I was in and it, and it only took 12 weeks. And then, you know, I've, when I came to the States and I started to see a lot of, uh, young, you know, young creatives, um, a lot of people wanting me to look at their books and things like that. And you realize that we're only seeing, um, you know, work essentially students from the same few places, you know, and these places are, you know, three years, a three year commitment after you've done college a lot of the, a lot of the time, it, they cost thousands of dollars a year, um, you know, just to go to these schools, just to put a book together um, is kind of an act of privilege, you know? Um, and for me, I think that was like when I started to, realize that we're we're just if we keep going back to the same places you know um for our talent we're going to keep getting the same kind of talent um you know and two um there are, i know there are a lot of agencies you know that are kind of recognizing this now and you know i know that droga started something where we're kind of deliberately looking outside that you know traditional kind of pipeline um because you know as to chris's point like uh the amount that this, that this industry kind of benefits from black culture, you know, and the amount that we reference it and use it to kind of sell various products um, is, is insane when you look at the lack of black talent actually making the work or, you know, making those decisions, you know, so we're kind of saying a lot of, a lot of the time the industry has been saying, we'll take your culture, but we won't actually, you know, take you on, a, on board as an employee. Um, so, I would love to just see agencies um, making more connections with kind of local like community colleges or organizations, you know, and really um, making a commitment to kind of pull talent or source talent from um, less traditional places. And also think about the requirements that they have, you know, for, um, for bringing people in, you know, I think, I think there's this idea in the creative department anyway, that, you know, advertising is, is uh, a meritocracy and all that matters is your book, you know, like anyone can have a good idea. Um, and it's just not true because uh, having good ideas takes time and it takes like space and, you know, it takes um, being exposed to all kinds of, uh, you know, all kinds of creative influence. And all of those things are much easier to do when you come from, you know, a place of privilege when you're not necessarily worried about the the basics, you know, of life. And so I think like we have to rethink about what are our requirements for, for people coming in, you know, like, are we, are we going to stick to this model of like, well, show me a book, you know, or are we actually going to be, is it more about let's sit down and have a discussion and let's find like you find, you might find out that this person does something on the side that isn't, traditionally advertising they might not have any print ads in their book but you know when was the last time we made any print ads or bring them on to do something else you know because i think what we need to kind of think about ourselves is like you know that is the culture young black culture is the culture that is essentially driving a lot of mainstream culture right now you know so 
why are we kind of putting this, putting it through this traditional filter? Um, you know, and that's, uh, that's really on us as, as like Chris was saying, as the gatekeepers, you know, we have to change, um, uh, I think what it is that, um, we're setting up as the kind of, you know, the way that we bring people in. Um, I just want to add to that though, that I think there's this, and it was when I started even, I was the only Indian person I could imagine in the entire industry when I started because economically, why would you ever go into the advertising? It's never spoken of. It's never considered as a career option because, you know, it's, it's just not something you want to have, make a living, you know, want it, it just the idea that you can't live off, you know, there's the, they don't pay enough for you to have a good life and a good career. And you don't know that there's all these other opportunities that come out of this art and commerce industry and that's where the education is lacking it's not just creative or account management there's production there's you know strategy there's artists you know the whole combination of art and commerce i think is just completely hidden from a large population that this could be a career choice for you and i think especially when there is creativity in that person and they're they don't know that you could make a really good living and you could be part of a really incredible community um and it starts really young i think for me what i saw was like you know like venice arts they they teach art to underprivileged kids i would like i got an intern from there because you know i wanted to make sure i was reaching instead of from some you know like you said, a traditional place where we're going to end up with people who already have the privilege of this. Um, I think we have to do more of that and which we are now, thank goodness. This is, I think the awareness has gone beyond just people of color doing that to now white agents saying they're going to do this and, you know, agencies saying there. So I, Laura and I were talking, um, like let's take a you know let's use that let's use that to build up and surface all the people and to educate people um i think this is a really great opportunity for these conversations but so that everyone can be aware that don't just look for your assistants your in you know your interns your juniors in traditional places what you were saying um no Oriel, is that look outside that look into the lower economic places like community colleges like organizations that are trying to help underprivileged children because that's when we want them to become aware that the you can succeed and have a dream in this community we want them you know we want to grow this and i think we can't if we don't outreach to the youngest population and with education you know i think the more outreach we can do and create panels or create um meetings or events that bring in these you know kids teenagers college young adults you know it, back into the community and have them thrive here is what's going to help us change what this whole thing looks like yeah i remember um i used to teach k through six art and um I remember a lot of my students, they either wanted to be a basketball player or the person on the cover of the magazine. And so I was always like, you know, I would always challenge them to be like, hey, like, you know, they'd come in with their cool backpack and I'm like, it's a cool backpack. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, you know that someone like designed that? And they're like, what? You know, like really trying to educate from a very young age that like someone made that magazine. Someone took that picture and that, you know, who like, just because like you guys are saying, like there's just a lack of education. You don't know, you just see this surface like shiny thing, but there's so many layers where you can be involved. Um, and there's, we just have to, or all of us, for me at least, like anytime I meet anyone who's an aspiring photographer, especially young black man or woman, um, I'm so, deeply interested in what they see and what they want to see more of as far as their eyes go. And so, you know, I, I, I tend to kind of maybe be a little too invasive because I can be like, Hey, well, what, do you want to get on set? Do you want where do you want to be? Like, where do you see yourself? And they're like, I, I, I don't know what that, that is, you know? And so I'm always trying to just sh bring people on to see, <laughs> to like be exposed to learn like, oh, that's, I don't want to do that. But at least I know, you know, just, just the education piece is so important. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, so one of the things I'd love to chat about is difficult conversations. <laughs> um, you know, we have that, that brilliant book back in the day, um, how to have difficult conversations. And I, how do you have conversations when people are being <laughs> racist <laughs> or when you get a bid that is really problematic or when you are having a meeting and um, there are things that are, are exchange or casting suggestions that don't necessarily um, feel good to you. Can we chat a little bit about how you guys handle that? I kind of have like, it's all over the place, right? Because microaggressions are all over the place, like the levels. Um, there are times where, yeah, I still suffer from not wanting to rock the boat, right? Um, and then there are times where it is so easy to just spit back and, and, or not spit back, but just be like, hey, you dropped something, this is yours. Like, because like, as you said, we've been packing that on for so long that like, for me now, I'm almost 40. So I don't have the bandwidth to tolerate what I did when I was, 20 out the gate, just, just thirsty for work. So it's, I'm still investigating that question personally too, because it trickles down to your personal relationships, uh, how, how you allow people to talk to you anywhere you go. So I think it's, um, and yet they're all so different, right? Like, I think that we are, what we're seeing is this awakening where white people are like, oh, racism isn't just like saying the N-word. <laughs> like it isn't just like, you know, burning a cross on a lawn. It's like, no, this shit is everywhere. Like from like crayon colors to band-aids to, <laughs> to, to you name it. And we've felt it. And so, yeah, I think it's just this threshold of like where you are in your life I mean, you know, like, I think for me, that's one thing that's really important is to not only show up for myself, but to really acknowledge where people are on their journey, especially people of color, it, it, you know, to not like, to not disempower someone who didn't say something because we've all been there. <laughs> and at this point, I'm like, my North Star is healing. Like if it isn't healing, it's hurting. And so to me now, that's like becoming very clear. Um, and we've been quarantined, so I haven't been on set. So I guess we'll see how we deal with awkward and racist microaggressions. And um, I, think, I think a lot of that is also about the place in which it's coming from, you know? Are you, are you, you know, are you intentionally, you know, being um, antagonizing and, you know, do you know what you're doing versus, oh, you just don't have any idea. And then it's like, that's when the wholeness, the antagonizing part is when I go, oh, you know what you're doing and you're just being a dick. Okay. So like, you know, I, now I have to manipulate this question a different way versus you don't know. And it's like, all right, I'm going to have to educate you. And if this happens again, then now you're, you're, you're on the other side, you're antagonizing again. And um, it's very hard to approach those questions. And I think it's, it's a level of sensitivity now where people are even asking at this point, like, you know, did that come out any kind of way or anything like this? So how, and it's just like, this is, this is if like, you know, I, I've never been a fan of like, you know, the, the diversity committees and things like that, because it's like, like, like I shouldn't, nobody should have to, teach you how to treat somebody else did, did did they have to give you a lesson on how to treat your white co-worker you know no they didn't right so treat me the same as you treat them and everything will be fine and um i think that's the struggle that i have with it on a daily basis and sometimes you know i, I used to like take take all those things and i've been getting into like meditation and all kinds of shit lately and i think you have to also learn that so many people so many people their battles within and it has nothing to do with you and then two, you have to learn that everything will come to light. Trust me. Those people who are on top of this world, Harvey Weinstein, half a billion dollars, 
<laughs> so don't ever think that you know um, you're missing the opportunity to expose somebody. You just you're just allowing you're just allowing them to expose themselves at some point, which eventually all, always comes you know always comes to light. It's always going to happen. And, and I look at those situations and I laugh, and then I have to you know decide what I want to put my energy into. Do I want to put my energy into fixing people like that? Or don't want to put my energy into educating educating more people like me to get through the door, you know. So that's one less person that's hired like that in the future because you really can't con control the past, you know. Um, you can only really control your present and 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 do what you can to influence the future, and that and that's just where I put all my energy at now. You know, I listen and I'll, I'll speak to somebody from my diversity committee as more so just as a nice gesture than the, than than anything else because. That is not my goal to fix those people. I'm sorry. That is generational. What 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 is wrong with them cannot I cannot fix in in two or three diversity meetings. I'm sorry. And you should have thought about this before you hired them. This is your problem now. Thank you. Like I think um <laughs> so good. Um like Lauren, like you were saying, like um avoiding we've I think we've all avoided those conversations at one time or another, right? You, you kind of, you're just like in the moment, you're like, do I really want to, you know, do this right now? Cause I I'm trying to do my own job, you know, um, like it's, it's really just going to mess it up for me as well. Um, and I probably have like avoided more of them than I've, I've kind of taken on. Um, but I do think, and I always go back to this as like a, an example when I think about, how it should be done and how I think like what it looks like when you do confront it. So um, I'll tell you that, that story we were, um, you know, we'd pitched for this client. I'm not going to say who, um, but they're a big, big, big client. Um, and we went through the pitch and the whole time they're telling us like, you know, we're not, you know, we don't just say um, that we're, we're into diversity. Like diversity is the core of our business. And we're like, this is cool. Like th they're really, they mean this, you know, even though the whole room was like all white women, we're like, you know, but they, okay, they're, they're, they're saying it. Um, so this, this is going to be good. Um, and then we won the pitch and we kind of got into the work. Um, we found a great director who was just, uh, you know, had just had a great, not only a great eye, but was just very active in kind of, um, making sh like representation, you know, he was, uh, like had a great kind of, uh, cast. Um, usually he would cast like great characters, um, gay, trans, black, like we were like so happy to have him. Um, so all the ingredients were kind of lining up. We we're like, okay, we've got the client who's king for it. We've got the director who's going to deliver. We had two amazing, um, days of casting in LA and just like the best, you know, we ended up with the best kind of cast like the most diverse cast i've ever um ever put together and then we started going through it with the client you know and they were on on a call and we send them over and then we waited and then we got back the feedback and and it was like um yeah we think this is you know this cast is great but it feels a bit a bit urban um a bit edgy um a bit gritty and we were just like suddenly it was like all these things and you're just like really like you after all this you know this is what we're going to do and they were like yeah we just you know our girl our target is uh, is an all-american you know you've got to think of like the all-american girl you know in the midwest and we were just like well i mean you didn't say that in the pitch um and if i think maybe the reason this this specific instant instance hurt more or that we were more angry was because they had spent so long telling us how much of a champion they, they were and how much, you know, that was part of their business. Um, and so that we kind of really believed them. Um, and we sold that, we sold the director on that. Like you're going to get to put together the most diverse cast, you know, that you've ever done. And so he was, he was furious um, because they essentially asked us, it came down to like, you know, them putting crosses over the four um, darkest skinned women um, and then selecting from what, what our like third choice backups, the the whitest, blondest like replacements. And we were just like, I can't believe this is happening. But, you know, and, and in most cases, you know, I think like you've just, 
it, the agency would have, would be like, well, we've just won the pitch. This is a lot of money. It keeps this off. It helps grow this office and all that stuff. But in this case, it was just different. And the director was like, well, look, I'm ready to fight this. I'm going to, I'll, I'll walk away from the job. You know, if, um, if you guys are, are down and we were like, well, okay, if he's down, then, you know, and the production company were like, yeah, we'll, we'll lose this. We'll walk away from it. If you, if you want to like fight this and we, we were all the creatives kind of came together and we were like, yeah, let's, let's do this. Let's fight it. Um, and get really uncomfortable. And then we had, you know, we escalated it and our, um, even our bosses were like, yeah, let's do it. Let's fight. Um, let's escalate it all the way to the top. Let's go back to them. And they did. And to their credit, they escalated all the way up to kind of the holding company level, you know, um, unbeknownst to the client, they, they had just sent over this, you know, their wish list and were waiting to hear back. And then what they got back was an email from our kind of global CCO, like, Hey, so what you did was, uh, very racist. And, um, when you arrive, uh, at the pre-production meeting tomorrow, uh, you were probably going to feel a lot of that, a lot of tension from the team, like essentially just calling them out to their face, um, and telling them that you really need to fix this like right now. Um, otherwise, you know, we're not really going to go forward with this relationship and we're willing to just walk away from the account, from the job and, and deal with whatever those consequences are. And I think like, you know, it, it's the example that sticks in my mind because it's really the only time that's happened, you know, sadly, but I think we, we always feel like when we're on the side of, when we're on the vendor side, you know, um, that we don't have the power to kind of, to, to push back and say, no, we're worried about losing that job or losing the account, you know, and, um, a lot of that time, a lot of the time that, that is, you know, why we stay silent is because we, we do have to think about the, the bills that we have to pay. But, um, in this case, it, you know, I th it was a great example of, everyone kind of coming together and presenting that unified front and then the weight of that kind of corporate um, response, you know, made it, made it real, made it serious. And the CMO came in um, the next day, flew into the pre-production meeting and we kind of went into a room uh, just like three of us. And I got to go through all the ways that all the things that they had, you know, said or done that had been racist over like the past 48 hours and just kind of like show them the receipts. And, you know, she just had to kind of sit there and, you know, be uncomfortable. It was, you know, it was uncomfortable for her. But again, as I was saying earlier, it's like, that's the discomfort we deal with, you know, kind of on a daily basis. So like, you know, you can be uncomfortable. I don't really care. Um, and we did, we did manage to kind of get her back to the cast that we wanted. Um, so it, it does maybe feel like it's a lot of fighting just to put like three people in a 30 second spot, you know, that most people are going to change the channel the minute it comes on. But I feel like those, that those are the things that we need to do, uh, more on a more regular basis. That's what it looks like. I think like, you know, all these diversity committees are great and they're doing great work into, but it's, that is where, um, you know, I think the fight, that's the kind of front lines is where you're, you're willing to take a hit. Um, you, you might be, you might even lose some money. You might lose a client. Um, you know, are you willing to take that, that risk and take live with those consequences, um, in order to call, like call it out and be uncomfortable. And, that that point that's that's such an incredible story Ariel but it reminds me of how many times we have presented new talent to uh, bigger clients within the agency and the clients have said no in you know preferring someone who's a lot more established someone who perhaps had the resources that this individuals we're presenting don't have so in 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 regards of like taking in regards of taking that first step, it's it's something that I, I'm I'm really with every project that I have 
um, and always have just try to kind of bring in those new individuals, um, introduce the clients to them. Um, this is someone I have a relationship with. This is a photographer I worked with before. Perhaps her book or his book is not up to 100% what we're looking for, but this is a relationship that we already established with him or her and built. Um, and it's really introducing, introducing them to the way we work and introducing them to the client that I feel um, could start to make a difference. Um, but I mean that your, your story is so, in, I've never heard of such an insane thing like this before. So it's, it's really wild. Um, well, hopefully oh. it starts to happen more too, because, you know, I think one of the big things which you both alluded to is it's financial. You know, they're afraid to say no to the client. I, I mean, no matter what, you know, our, our great creative, the great intentions, the real sort of stories, you know, an agency or creative or, you know, want to tell, it's usually watered down because of financial reasons and because, you know, the parent company, the manager, the president, the holding company won't back you on that. And I, hopefully that will change now because I think now there is a big spotlight on that's not okay anymore. You know, that you have got to stand up for it. You've got, and unfortunately it's probably almost like now they're going to use it as PR spin to be like, look what we did. But if it benefits, you know, bringing in and surfacing everyone's, you know, from talent to hiring people to hiring artists, if it creates, you know, allows that sort of inclusion to happen, I think we, it's good. We should take it, you know, like in that situation. So it is such, I've never, I've 35 years and I haven't heard that. I think there were a couple times, but it was never for something like that, for something so important to actually change, um, to put your whole, you know, company on the line for what's right. You know, it's important. And I hope this is the time that that starts to happen. Um, it just, you know, I think that the more it happens, and I think creatives are in a really important position for that too. You know, I think production is for hiring. I think artists, of course, are with their crews. Agents are with who they bring on their roster. Um, I think, but with creatives too, I think the the what you mentioned about um, casting. The biggest thing I've seen in casting shifts is when I first started, all the casting was white. Then in the last, like right before I left Shiat in the last like five, and now as an agent, the casting we, requests we get from clients, and it, it's all ethnically mixed, just this generic middle ground. It's not like, let's go and like, you know, get some, you know, real range and skin and like, you know, look and feel. It's this, just like this very homogenized, middle ground. And I hope we start to see the shift. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to see commercials and prints and, and people, and it's just, you know, it's like this shift of like who we're looking at, you know, it would be, it would be beautiful, you know, and I think this is the time and I think creatives are in an amazing position to push that. There's always been this, um, you know, this defense, you know, the, the, the defense you'd often hear, from a client or a brand is that you know our our target you know our kind of ideal customer looks a certain way and has you know has certain interests or whatever or lives in a certain place and you just kind of it's hard to argue about that you're like well i guess that that's the person who buys their product so but there's this underlying assumption that somehow that person seeing a black you know, woman or black man selling this product will immediately stop buying it, you know? And, and you're like, wait, are we all just operating on that assumption? You know, are we just kind of saying that we have to show, you know, we have to kind of reflect the target back at them um, in order to kind of, you know, basically pander to their, their worst kind of racist instincts. Um, and then are we saying, are we comfortable? If that's your target, if you're, if you're worried that your target will stop buying your product because of, there's black people in the ad, you know, do you want, do you want to sell to that person? You know, are you still comfortable with that being your target? And I think that's the kind of questions I would love to see 
agencies push their clients on now, you know, because I think that's a defense that we've heard a lot. You know, you also hear it across gender lines. It's like, well, 80% of women buy, like make all the um, household purchasing decisions, which is why we keep putting moms in, in diaper commercials, you know, and you're like, well, you know, do women want to make all the household purchasing decisions? Maybe they, they maybe they feel like that role is being pushed on them by the industry because we keep showing women in the commercials, you know, like I, I feel like sometimes we, 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 we are culture leaders when we want to be, when it's something good, but then when it's like uh, something like that, when you get pushed back like that, we, we kind of say, well, we're just doing, we're just reflecting the, the audience, you know? And I think that's those assumptions. I think this feels like the time to just really pull apart those assumptions and say, you know what, there's no reason that we keep have to, uh, we have to show or pander to our, our audiences or our targets, um, kind of most basic instincts, you know? Um, you know, we can actually lead this shift by showing a much more diverse kind of representation. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, well, I think the one thing I do know is that the census numbers are changing. The demographic makeup of the U.S. is changing drastically. Um, and it's really curious to me um, how it seems that there's this hole that's being um, this grasp on what was instead of really taking steps to moving towards the future um, in terms of uh, creating um, ads that uh, that really speak to people of color as well as to white people in this country. Um, and I do wonder whether or not um, there is a belief that the human condition really isn't human because at the at the base of what we do is really to appeal to that condition, right? Um, and it seems to me sometimes that um, the assumption is that the white audience is more willing to purchase from people who look like them and that people of color are also willing to purchase from people who ads um, to prefer ads with who have people of um, what people in it, but the reverse isn't true. And I'm not sure if you guys have any thoughts on that. Just I have one second. I'm, I'm so sorry that I mean to interrupt you, Lauren. Um, mm -hmm. I unfortunately have to jump off to a client call, but it's been great. Thank you guys so much for having me here. I will send you some links that I would like to share with the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, Astrid. Yeah. Um, I don't, I can't, I feel like I've already lost the question. Um, but what came to me when you were asking it was that just as a consumer myself, um, growing up and never seeing myself represented, you know, like in products in, you know, it was like, there was the black hair aisle and then there was like Pantene and all that. And I'm, half white, half black. And so I was always like, uh, this product doesn't work for me. This product doesn't work for me. And so when I think about now being on the other side of that, um, it just, the word that keeps coming to my mind is authenticity. Like, I think that the challenge for me right now is this inauthenticity with brands who are like, Black Lives Matter now. And it's just like, um, it's really, really hard to swallow because it's like, for me, I've always photographed my world. I didn't have to uh, do anything different besides be myself and see what I see. Um, so I understand that that isn't available to clients all the time, right? Like they're trying to see something different. And it's just, um, as a person who, whose identity was really stunted growing up because I didn't see myself, um, I find it really important to photograph my world. Um, and, and, and wherever that lands, cool. Um, but yeah, again, I can't remember what your question was, but I like started, I like, those were the things that came to my mind when you asked. Before well, I think that. in essence, I was saying, um, why does it have to be that, um, why, why do you think there really is a belief that white 
an, a white audience will only buy from um, ads that depict the the white idealized life. Like um, as Ariel said, you know the the all American girl or the all American mom or dad, um, and couldn't we have that same, or maybe I'm being a little bit um, naive, can't we have that same all-American um, look with someone of color in, in an ad? Well, that was, that's, okay, yes, that's what I was saying. So that was always my thing was like, I remember when I first got into the industry and like the concept of lifestyle was new to me and everything in lifestyle was white, everything. And if it was black, it was inauthentic, right? Like it, I'm pretty confident it wasn't a black photographer shooting it. And so not that it has to be, but it was lost in translation easily. Um, and so that was like a conscious goal of mine was like, wait a minute, I think these people think black people don't like to have picnics or black people don't like to be on boats or that we don't go camping or all this shit that I was like, I'm just gonna, it's so bigger than me <laughs> that I'm going to just photograph what I do and who I do it with. Um, so that's how my casting started. was just my homies, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just people I, I kicked it with. Um, and, and I do remember when I started to make that conscious decision of how I was going to present my work online. Like I remember critiques being like, uh, do you think you maybe want to put in like, a little more white pe you know and i was like there's plenty it's just that you see a bunch of brown and black faces so you're yeah. thinking it's a little too much of something and that's just where i won't budge with my work is where i feel the safest i've been told actually um you know more than once like we don't want to overcorrect. like it's that same thing where we have if you have multiple more than normal or usual um amount of like black people in, in a spot or in a, in a in a you know print ad or something you know they're like yeah we don't want to overcorrect. we don't want to um you know it doesn't feel believable like that's there's all that, that there's that code that you can have learned to decipher um sometimes it's not even code um you know but it's like what you're saying this idea that what black people yeah don't like to kind of drive nice cars or do all of this kind of very normal stuff, you know, and, and that when you do show diversity, it's for like a, a specific, you're making a, a statement or something. And, and for me, I, I'm like, I want to get to the point where it's just, it's, um, it's so normal. It's boring, you know, um, like it shouldn't be a question anymore. Um, you know, and I think brands, a lot of the you know brands that I've worked with don't realize their role as, as kind of not just gatekeepers, but the, they're the people who can normalize things. They can, they can, you know, they can actually normalize uh, an ad where everyone in it is black. But this isn't a, this isn't a product for just for black people. This is for for everyone. But like we don't question it when it's an all white ad, or you know, it's just that's that's considered normal. And black people just have to assume that it's also a product for them. Um, and I think a lot of brands don't realize the, the, the role that they play in normalizing that stuff, you know, um, because, you know, films and music occupy a very different space. You know, they are there to make statements, whereas, you know, we, you know, my career is basically built on the stuff that goes in between, you know, and it's kind of like the wallpaper um, of your like uh, of your kind of media consumption. You know, it's it's it, it's almost like you don't notice it. But if you kind of grow up and it's just there all the time, you do come to accept it as normal. And so I think that's why it is so important that we, you know, have ads where everyone is black and we don't make a statement about it. We don't release a PR, uh, you know, we don't put it out as a PR and say, look what we did. You know, I often think like if, if companies, you know, could never talk about their efforts on diversity again, would they still do it? You know, I think that's the test is like, if you cancel every um, panel discussion on diversity and, and C CEOs couldn't um, put out their kind of progress reports, would they still be doing it? You know, and that's, that's the big test I think is, um, you know, will you do the work even though, even if there's no one around to kind of applaud you for it?
Great. Um, Jagisha, I was curious um, what it's been like for you to, um, as an artist agent, to really um, be on the side and really uh, try to get to manage these conversations on the behalf of your of your talents. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's it's this point of that like it should become the normal, but yet it's not. So you have to bring it. You have to sort of acknowledge the diversity, but you. I don't want to do that because, for me, I feel like it should be about the work, but the work needs to come from so many places and like everyone who's talented and who wants to do this and has the passion should have the opportunity to be seen, to be part of, you know, I think, you know, as you were saying, like if we could have an, an entire cast, you know, casting and it's just beautiful black families and, and no one thinks it's any different. It's just the casting, you know, same thing with when we are, pitching and showing work for our artists it shouldn't be about what their race is or the color of their skin or ethnicity or gender even really you know it should be about the quality of the work the reason it matters is because the opportunities have been sub just not been given to them and, and honestly it's they've been um pushed down it's been it's actually been pushed to the side it hasn't been an it hasn't been a priority it hasn't even been an awareness it's that whole thing of it's the racism is just the it is just the the lack of knowing that you're doing it the lack of looking at your list you just made and everybody on there is white and 90 percent are men that should blow your mind you know like your list should have diversity your list but it should happen because we as a community and we're doing it you know we need to make sure that there is just more education there's more opportunities all of us already do that we already look when we're hiring when we're bringing on artists when we're having meetings we're looking for I want, I don't want to be in a room of white people. I want to be in a room of, you know, the right people of all color, you know? Um, and maybe I gravitate one way than the other. It's just because we see it right now. And I think a lot of people don't, haven't seen it. Now they're seeing it. So we're hopefully going to see a shift. But I think for me, it's just the hard conversation is, is almost to not say, oh, Lauren's a black photographer. I don't want to ever say that because she's a fucking badass, talented photographer. That is it, period. But it's important right now that she's a black photographer and she should be speaking up, you know, and we are speaking up. And But I think for me, that's almost what the uncomfortable conversation is, is that I have to say that to people, you know, that's what's uncomfortable. And so, and we had an interesting conversation on, on one of our bids, or actually you had the job, but you know, you were like, well, should I do? And I think you were almost like, I'm so happy to get this big brand job. So should I speak out and talk about this like cat or should I be more dominant in how I feel? Like and I was like, yes, you should cast this the way you want. You should speak out. You, this is your, you know, like you can own it. And I think that was that one moment in the beginning where you were like, I'm so grateful to have this, but you shouldn't be grateful. You're talented. It's, you know, like, that those are you know that's an uncomfortable conversation too i think it goes all the way around i think with creatives for me the conversation too is like you know especially if they're white creatives um like be bolder use your power you have power here and i know you want it but you're just not aware of it or you're not using it I think I've had this conversation, the most uncomfortable conversation I've had is to my white friends that you have privilege. You are the most powerful people right now in the sense of for you to acknowledge and say that this has happened is powerful. You know, that's an uncomfortable conversation. Some people don't like to hear, you know. I think you just answered the question. It acknowledges that you benefited, you know, that somehow, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I, I freeze. No, I, 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 I agree. I think what Jigish was saying was is so true is that it's uncomfortable, I think, because, you know, if you are white and to acknowledge the kind of the power that you have is to also acknowledge that 
your career has been kind of helped or at least hasn't been um, hindered, you know, by the, the fact that you're white, you know, like you've, you've had all these opportunities and, and what you might like to think of as, as the results of your, your kind of your own personal talent and um, unique ability isn't necessarily the case. You know, I think that's why it's probably uncomfortable, you know, for a, a lot of white people to acknowledge that, that they do have that power of privileges because it, it's essentially saying that you're not there by um, just by the virtue of your own talent. You've had, uh, you've kind of, you know, been riding this wave. And, um, but I do, I do kind of, I see a lot of people recognizing that, especially in my kind of circle. So I, it does give me a lot of hope. Um, you know, that we, we do work in, in an industry generally where people um, are at least open to challenging themselves. Um, and especially kind of the generation that I feel is, is coming into like more senior roles now. Um, I think they're, they're much more aware of that, that their role and their privilege um, to kind of speak out. Um, we have a question that came in um, Tim McGuire says, as a white photographer of 30 years, I feel my preconceived ideas and those norms I was taught by the industry just got blown out of the water by all of you. And he says, thank you. Um, so I wanted to bring up a quote. My favorite quote these days is one by Angela Davis. And she said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. And to you, what I want to ask, um, what are some of the things that you're no longer willing to accept these days? I'm so excited to answer this question. <laughs> and truly because it's my brother the other, the other day we were talking and he's like, look, it's just two buckets at this point and you're either helping or you're hurting. So to me, as I process internally personal shit that I've had to deal with, that then obviously shapes who I've become as a woman and how I show up at work. Um, those things for me are now just a matter of healing, which I said earlier. So to me, it's like, if, it, if I feel it and it hurts, I'm not taking it. I don't need to be aggressive back, but it's this fine line. It's like if you're passive and aggressive, like finding that beautiful sweet spot of assertion that I, you know, the best way I can put it is like almost 40 year old Lauren is here to stand up for young Lauren who never said shit and who took all that, all those punches and um, out of not wanting to make white people uncomfortable. So where I feel this big collective shift, where I feel the paradigm shift, where I feel that there is an awakening is that there are people, white people who are acknowledging now like, oh, okay. Um, and, and those people I'm, I'm happy to, to welcome into the classroom. I'm not at a stage in my life where I wanna kick people out of the classroom anymore, but uh, yeah. Just, I'm not tolerating anything that hurts. Um, I, I agree. Um, I was, yeah, I, I'm going to say the same thing, essentially, that, um, you know, I'm going to put the challenge on myself that I, I will speak out kind of in the moment, you know, in real time. And um, if that requires being uncomfortable, then so be it. Um, because I think, you know, as Lauren said, it's like you, you are at this point, you're either kind of silent and, and you're essentially supporting, um, you know, a system, an old system, um, or you are going to actively work um, to, to take it apart, you know, and, and give us the space to kind of build something else. Um, so, yeah, I think that's for me is, is the thing I, I'm not going to accept anymore is, is um, are those, those moments where, you know, as Lauren was saying, is it when it hurts, you know, and, and I would usually have kind of taken it in silence and taken on that discomfort and not spread it and just focused on doing the job. Um, you know, this is all also now part of my job, 
you know, is to, uh, is to call it out in real time and make sure that people know exactly what it was um, that either happened or that was said or, you know, um, that is, is racist, you know, and um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the work. Um, I think I'm different in that I actually acknowledge my privilege. Like I am in the middle, you know, I don't even think I would have gotten the job at Shayat if my skin had been darker, if I'd been a darker Indian. There were no dark Indians, you know, anywhere to be seen. And I like said 65% sure part of why I got the job was my skin is lighter than most Indians. And I acknowledge that. I know that I've had a really, I've worked hard and I've earned, you know, what I've earned, but I've also not had to struggle in the same way because the, of the color of my skin and also economically. So I had a lot of privilege and I was able to get very, but I, I always try to use my voice and acknowledge that and try to, you know, so for me, what I will not accept is that I, it, we will not, you know, we won't stay silent. We'll continue to try to, you know, have the uncomfortable conversations. And I acknowledge like I'm in a position to have that uncomfortable conversation and to try to bridge that gap for myself as much as, you know, everybody. But for me, it's really that like I can do more and I'm going to. You know, and I want to take advantage of the momentum to do as much as possible. Thank you. Um, so we are going to start wrapping up. Um, I have two questions left for you. Um, the, the, the first one is, you know, this is all very heavy, at least for me. And I need to um, always find a way to kind of refresh myself and to um, I guess, fill up my tank of hope, um, if you will. How do you refresh yourself? How do you gear yourself up to go back in the ring, so to speak? I'll, I'll go. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's a good question because it's so important right now. I think three weeks ago, I, I wouldn't have known how to answer. Um, you know, it, it felt hopeless. And it felt like there was nothing that I could do to kind of refresh myself, you know, um, you know, and I think that's when it was just really just all anger. Um, and then in the last few weeks, I've, I've made an effort. I have tried to kind of not disengage even, I think even get more engaged, you know, usually I'd say, I'll oh, step away from Twitter and step away from, you know, the news, but actually I think I've been into it more than ever. Um, but I've also been kind of reaching out and connecting with um, friends who are, I know that are going through the same thing, um, you know, and I, if anything, like my kind of circle of people, you know, um, black professionals, we're all way more actively just checking in on each other, you know, and, and having those conversations and just daily, just like, how are you doing? You know, like what's happening. Um, and that's helped a lot, you know, just really kind of, being there for each other has helped a lot. Um, I actually, uh, something that was really, that really recharged me this weekend, just gone, a friend of mine uh, runs a, a graphic design company and we went in and we made these posters. We made a whole bunch of protest posters. Uh, he, he's like, you know, done, does screen printing and all that stuff. And so we spent the day uh, screen printing um, protest posters, which we're gonna go and march on, on Sunday and we're gonna hand out to people you know, but it was just feeling like you're um, actively participating has been very helpful for me. You know, um, we've been on a bunch of marches. We're going to go on more and that that's helped, I think. And also, you know, writing and, and just putting my own kind of feelings and thoughts and stories into words and putting them down and then seeing the responses has helped to kind of recharge and take that what initially was anger and kind of a sense of hopelessness and like redirected. And um, so actually that's, yeah, that's been um, kind of how I guess I've stayed, kept the energy and, uh, and also just going for runs, um, you know, putting on some music and running for a, a few minutes, it, it helps as well. Um, I'm going to just like copy paste 
a lot of what you just said <laughs> as far as like community goes and friends. Um, just the fact that like unpacking this with black and brown folks right now has just been like really healing. Uh, crying to people, <laughs> Shagisha, has been really healing to me to just release some of the pain and anger and frustration and disappointment. Uh, disappointment's like one of the heavier ones for me to process because it's just so disappointing, <laughs> especially in personal relationships. But um, yeah, like the release is a big part of uh, the healing. And so I've been, and, and at the same time, um, it's been a lot of anger. So I have had to just sort of use stillness and quiet to just sort of get my mind right um, so that when I throw my dart, it's on target um, because I got some darts to throw and um, though I will take that out in like my self-guided personal work. So I've been writing a lot, writing has been helping, yoga, meditation, all the things. Um, and then professionally, really standing in my power and, and really um, campaigning for empowerment, right? Like, you know, we're gonna get the campaigns like any day now that are gonna be like, here's what we wanna do. <laughs> and, and, and I want to just really be a part of the empowerment of that aspect, not the disempowerment or the struggle. Um, and so that to me has been something that's been helping me sort of, um, I'd almost feel, <laughs> this is maybe a little extreme, but it almost feels like I'm like shining my boots, sharpening my knife, like I'm getting ready for war in the sense of how I'm going to show up in all my situations, whether it be work or um, personal fine art stuff. Um, so yeah, that, and, and, it, and in order to be prepared, you need to have those conversations with your friends. You need to cry. You need to uh, be sad, you know, and be mad. Um, I love that you guys still screen posters because there's also that like physical aspect of making something um, and then distributing it, which if you need my address. Uh... <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, just just like, again, all things healing and, and not in that spiritual bypass way of like, just meditate. <laughs> it, it, it's so much deeper than that. So yeah. Um, I mean, I think for me, it was the healing and the sort of how to kind of refuel is reading. I love reading. So, and I, I mostly read fiction. So I love Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, a lot of Indian authors and Alice Hoffman, you know, so, um, reading is sort of really my healing. Other than that, I'm working. So, and I love working. So. <laughs> And I like watching the sunset every night. So I usually try to take a break and go watch the sunset from my room. So, Oh, that's great. Well, I'll have to um, send you an email to see what you're reading okay, yeah. offline. Um, so to close, I would just, first of all, like to say thank you. We appreciate this conversation so much. And I know I do because, um, one, this conversation has been therapeutic, but two, it's also been really wonderful to hear your experiences in terms of what's been going on in the industry. Um, and I'm so pleased that you are hopeful and that you do have your action plan and that you are prepared to show up and to demand change. So thank you. Um, so to close out, I just wanted to ask if you could share your um, your IG handle um, and how people could best be in touch with you. Um, everything is just my name, uh, laurencrew.com. My Instagram is just laurencrew. Uh, and you can follow the paper trail there of how to get a hold of me where you will land to Jagisha eventually. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm here and I'm available for work worldwide. <laughs> and collaborations, for sure. Uh, same, my, my name, 
um, just across all platforms except Facebook. Um, uh, but uh, on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm, I guess, sharing more kind of work-related stuff. On Twitter, I'm just like responding angrily to things, <laughs> things that I see um, or retweeting. Um, and Instagram uh, is kind of just, you know, pictures of my neighborhood. So it's not that interesting, but yeah, um, just my name, you'll find me. Uh, LinkedIn is uh, Jagisha Bouvra and um, Instagram at Bouvra Collective, also at Commune, K-O-M-Y-O-N. And then Facebook is me forwarding things angrily about shit that's going on. So. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then for me, everyone, it's uh, my name, Martine.Severin. Um, on Instagram. LinkedIn is just my name. And we started a new podcast. By we, I mean me, obviously. <laughs> um, and the podcast features creatives of color. And so it's just conversations with um, BIPOC. So it's called This Is How I This Is How We Create. So check it out. Great. And then we have American Photographic Artists has an Instagram and APANational.org. You can find all our social media. But I just wanted to give a heartfelt thank you to everybody who's participated in the panel and also those who watch because I feel like that's a way we get information out there is by, by sharing. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. I wanted to mention that Chris did have to step out. So if you're missing him, he did step out. Um, you can be in touch with him, Chris Butler, and his Instagram handle is at Bruva Chris. So that's it for now. Thank you so much for joining and we'll see you next time at APA Biz Talk. Bye. Thanks, Sobel. Bye.